Welcome to the Toronto International Film Festival. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer. I'm really pleased to be joined by Eva Orner for the world premiere of her film, Burning. Eva, welcome back to the festival. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. It's super exciting. So uh, Eva was last at uh, TIFF with her film, Bikram Yogi Guru Predator, uh, about the abusive side of the yoga icon. Uh, one of your earlier films is Taxi the Dark Side that you produced with uh, Alex Gibney and, and won the Oscar about US torture policy. Um, what made you take up the subject of burning? So I was actually, I mean, anything pre-COVID to me now feels like a hundred years ago, but I was in, a, in my, I'm from Australia, I live in LA, but I was in Australia um, the summer of 2019, 2020, when the fires were raging. And I spent a month there and it was so increasingly shocking to me. And we'd just gone through like the worst ever fires in California, which we're currently in again. And I kind of, as I was flying out of Australia with, you know, you know, watering eyes from the smoke leaving Sydney Airport. I was like, this is not what I grew up with. I lived in Australia for 34 years and I just thought, I think I need to do a film about this. And, you know, came back to LA and and a couple of years later, a pandemic later, here we are. But I think there was one other key issue that happened to me when I was in Melbourne, my hometown in Australia. There was a day when it was like 47 degrees Celsius. And I, as I said, I spent 34 years there and it never got above 44 degrees. So this whole, you know, temperature rising, maybe one, one and a half degrees. I was like, well, here's anecdotal evidence of a three temperature degree increase in my lifetime. And no one's flipping out about it. No one's screaming about the Barry Reef being destroyed. Everyone's kind of like, yeah, it's hot. And so I just thought, I think we need to look into this a little further. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so as you started moving forward, I wonder what were the things that you, you know, that you learned? Oh, I mean, sorry, sorry to be all doom and gloom. I know it's not what everyone wants to hear right now, but I mean, it's worse than we think it is. I think a lot of the projections by the scientists, you know, we're seeing from that UN paper that came out a few weeks ago, things, things are moving faster than we predicted and anticipated. And so if we want to realistically protect the next generations, we have to take action now. And it has to be government action across the globe. It can't, it's, I'm all about people power and community action, but at this point it needs to be legislation. It needs to be law. It needs to be world leaders committing to, you know, zero net, net zero by 2030, not 2050. And so many big countries that are hugely responsible for this are not doing that. Um, and I think the point of the film is to really explain what's going on, what was the story with the fires and what we need to do moving forward. And what we need to do moving forward is a lot more urgent than I think a lot of us realise. So yeah, obviously you're focusing on Australia, but the things you're saying uh, are uh, evidence that it's not, the, not a problem confined to Australia. I mean, I wonder if you can reflect on, you know, on, you know, what you see, uh, you know, other kind of key players in uh, in geopolitics, how they're responding to the situation. Yeah, I mean, look, I think, I mean, America's tricky at the minute, obviously, with a new government and a, and a government that's very, you know, that wants to be very climate forward, that has a lot of trouble getting legislation through <laughs> through the Senate. Um, so, I, you know, I think America's trying to do something. Um, I think Canada's been not bad. A lot, of, a lot of European countries are great, the Scandinavian countries. But, you know, a lot of the key superpowers are not being very good. And, you know, obviously China's one to point to, India. But at the same time, you know, Australia is responsible. We can say we have a small population, but we provide, we're the biggest coal mining company in, in the world and the biggest coal export or exporting co uh, country in the world. So we're supplying it to China and India who are burning it, creating all of these issues. So everyone has to take responsibility. It's too easy to pass the buck. And it needs to be a global meeting of the minds, which again, I realise is really hard to do in this day and age. I'm, a, I'm not, you know, I'm not this crazy optimist. Um, you know, I'm a realist. But it's now or never and it's sort of like you know the next generation you know 10 20 years we're going to be in big trouble i think we're already in big trouble now you know the fires in california horrendous australia in so many places that have never burned before i just flew into south dakota a couple of weeks ago on a location scout it was last week and we landed in um rapid city and it was you couldn't see anything there was so much smoke coming from oregon and wyoming and they've never seen anything like that before and so I feel like everyone knows about it, but no one's alarmist enough. And I think maybe a film like this will hopefully get people a little more agitated. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, in the film, we see two forces of opinion represented, but one by the government of Prime Minister Scott Morrison and the other by activists who are taking the streets, exemplified in the film by the teenager uh, Daisy Jeffrey. How do you see those two opposing views uh, playing out uh, today in, in Australia? I mean, you know, it's a little bit like Donald Trump and um, and Greta, you know, when Donald Trump slurred Greta, you know, attacking this 16 year old at the time. And Daisy is in the same position, you know, the, she's, our, she's our Greta basically. She's, this, she's now at college, she's I think 18 in her first year of college, but she was attacked by the Murdoch press. She was vilified. She had a horrible experience. She ended up in tears so many times, crushed, um, you know, almost depressed from her incredible activism at such a young age. Um, the government's response was, and it's in the film, is to say children should be focused on school, not activism, which to me is the whole point of school and the quite a shocking statement. So, you know, we really, people look at Australia and think it's a very progressive, um, you know, fantastic place, which it is, um, but we tend to have quite conservative governments as the majority. And the one we have now, you know, Scott Morrison was awarded a medal by Donald Trump at the end of Donald Trump's um term you know he's, he's very aligned with Trump on a lot of things and you know he's a religious man he's a pen, he's a he's a Hillsong member uh he's super conservative and he doesn't really seem to be very proactive in climate and he may be bullied in by the end of this year to commit to something more than he has but to this day we haven't committed to anything we don't have a climate policy on a federal level what we do have is a lot of states like all the state governments have committed to like net zero but that's a very different thing than having a government policy and also a commitment to stop mining coal so uh, we see in the film the, this activism taking place in the street, which is observed, you know, is not a, an, uh, an Australian thing to do to, uh, to take to the streets uh, like that. To, um, to, you know, can you give some perspective on, you know, was that a fluke? Is it growing? Do you think that uh, sometimes demonstrations take place and have real forward movement and sometimes demonstrations take place and that energy dissipates. And, and I wonder what's the case here. I mean, I think COVID's put a bit of a damper on demonstrations, but, you know, historically, I, I've always said that line that Daisy said, which is Australians don't demonstrate. You know, it's a very peaceful, calm, fortunate country. It's very similar to Canada. You know, we don't have a lot of big threats um, and reasons to panic. It's very, very similar to Canada. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very tricky about, whether the momentum will keep up. I think COVID's occupying everyone now because Australia's in terribly long lockdowns because they've been you know, completely isolated through COVID and now Delta's broken through and the vaccination rates are really low. So I think the problem is, is we have all these issues, we have the fires and just as people are getting involved in that, then we have COVID. And, and so it's really hard, I think, for people to, to, to pull through. But I think young people are really engaged in this. I think parents are really engaged in this i think it's a young person's movement and i think you know it's kind of in a way sadly up to the younger generations to to do something about this because we've failed them our generation has failed them and left them a planet that's in a pretty shitty condition can, uh, you've mentioned uh rupert murdoch's uh media empire and can you talk more about how that has shaped public opinion around climate crisis it's pretty shocking and I have a few friends and relatives who are, you know, Sky, it's Sky News in Australia and predominantly the Australian newspaper that Murdoch owned and they read and watch that religiously and it's funny because when I talk to them, if I go back and look online, they're just spouting out what was said the night before. I mean, it's really shocking and during the fires it was this absolutely heinous lie that the fires had been started by arsonists and we show that in the film. And it's like there was this plague of arsonists running around Australia lighting fires when it was the hottest, driest year on record. And it was clear that most of the fires were started by extreme weather. So they do things like that. You know, they do things like climate denying. Right now, a lot of the deniers who are in our film, the main one has just been thrown off Twitter in Australia um, because he's a, he's a COVID denier now. And they're having a huge problem with, you know, he's an anti-vaxxer and they're having a huge problem with that in Australia. So I feel like with the Murdoch media, it's what we all know. They are... They have a very clear platform and they push it and they push it hard and they won't stop. You know, they'll go after a 16 year old girl with abandon, with glee. I mean, they tore, you know, Daisy, the young activist to, you know, they tried to tear her to shreds, but she's strong and resilient and she's, you know, she's, she's come through with flying colors. 
but you know they're bullies and they're liars and they spread disinformation and I think you know the more they're off social media the more people the less people rely on them for news sources the better we are but you know look at America and Fox we're kind of screwed and I put it all down to Rupert Murdoch in the film, we see incalculable uh, human devastation. But I think for many viewers, the images that will resonate even more strongly are those of koalas and kangaroos and, and other animals. Um, but can you reflect a little bit more on the, the devastation to wildlife? And, you know, and I'm, I'm also curious how you handled that in the film, because I, uh, you know, I got to feel like audiences can only take so much. Yeah, we actually tried not to make it. I mean, I have this term because I've seen all the fire movies that have come out and I use this term fire porn and I really didn't want the film to be that. I didn't want it to just be, you know, fire after fire after fire, victim after victim after victim because I think we've seen a lot of that and that is in the film and it's important but I think we need to go beyond that in terms of like what is going on here, why is this happening, what do we do moving forward and we'll obviously you know, also when I came back to America from Australia, I felt like I'd never seen such international engagement with an Australian issue before. You know, the amount of money that was being poured into Australia from international sources because of the fires, people were just donating. And I felt a lot of that came from the animals because, you know, we have super cute animals in Australia. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, so we, we actually filmed with quite a lot of people that rescued the animals and we cut those stories, but it was too much and it was too heavy. So we really just relied on some very strong images and very subtle sort of soundtrack. And it's like, what more do you need to say other than three billion animals and, you know, insects, animals, reptiles were killed um, during the fires? I mean, I noticed it in a lot of the places we went to. You don't see the abundance of, in certain very fire hit areas, you don't see the abundance of natural wildlife, you know, the birds. Um, the koalas, the kangaroos, the wombats, you just don't see them. And the birds in a funny way is the most shocking because of the silence. Like there's just, there's no, there's nothing. And there's, we went to a lot of places, there were no flies. I mean, there are flies everywhere in Australia in, in summer when we were filming and there's just nothing. At one point we were in this sort of burnt out forest a year after the fires had gone through and our sound recorders just stopped recording. And I was like, dude, can, what are you doing? And he goes, there's nothing here. And I'm like, isn't that the sound of like, and it's like there's nothing to through. That was just like there was just silence, and that was really, really shocking. I mean, we saw we met a lot of amazing people with incredible resilience who have been through so much. You know, we went to so many towns that have been destroyed, and we, you know, we there are so many great people trying to fight this. But you know, my big argument is we need leadership, and that's what a lot of the key characters in this say, and the scientists all say. You know. It's Tim, Tim Flannery, one of Australia's leading, well, one of the world's leading climate scientists says, it's great to do everything you can in terms of solar, in terms of batteries, in terms of electric cars, whatever you can do. But at the end of the day, we need action fast. We need, we need government leadership globally. I mean, here we are a couple of years later, uh, as you uh, mentioned, you have fires uh, burning at record levels uh, ar around the world uh, right now. To, as you've been monitoring this, even after you've finished your film, um, what are you detecting as, as a public reaction uh, to, to, to what's happening this very summer? I mean, you know, we've got our air filters going again. We just got a bulletin today saying the smoke was coming to LA now from the California fires for the first time, and it was the same this time last year. I don't know. I feel like people are burdened and weary and tired of bad news. I think I really think COVID's been really, obviously, really tough on people. I think people are really aware that it's hotter and drier and the fires are worse and worse every year, but it's like, what do we do? And I feel like there's not a clear solution on that. And that's that's the issue, because we've known about this for decades. I mean, we all remember, I guess, depending on how old we are, but we're pretty old, Tom, you know, back in our, in our teens or even before that, hearing about, yeah, I think we called it, you know, global warming back then. Um, and then they tried to change, they changed it to climate change to make it sound, you know, so it accounts for like storms and rain and other weather. But we've known about this for a long time and we've done, you know, diddly squat about it. So I think, you know, I think we need to be screaming and shouting. It's, it's, it's beyond frightening. So as you described, Australia is deeply invested in uh, coal and natural gas um, and those kinds of investments, uh, 
or what impede change in, in all kinds of uh, countries. I wonder what you learned about the economic side of green energy that you know could pr potentially uh, replace uh, some of these uh, fossil fuel burning uh, uh, sources of energy. Oh, look, a lot of countries have done it. You know, Germany did it. Um, a lot of Scandinavian countries have been really forward on that. There's a very clear path to getting away, to getting to clean energy and getting away from coal and gas and mining. And, you know, we talk about mining in the film and one of our, he's sort of like the Elon Musk of Australia, Mike Cannon-Brooks, he's a young billionaire. And he says, mining is good. I don't think mining is good. I think it's bad for the environment. But, you know, do I have, am I talking to you on an, an, a Mac? Am I, is my iPhone here? You know, I use things that come from underground and I'm aware that we're hypocritical to say mining is bad and that's why we left it in because I thought it was kind of interesting and contentious. But we we don't have a choice. You know, jobs, sure, jobs will be lost. I'm not an economist, but jobs will be lost. Towns will be without their fundamental source of income when we stop mining, but they can all be retrained. This has happened many times in many countries when industries change and when times change. You know, we don't predominantly around the world, I mean, in a lot of places we do, but we don't have sweatshop labor in a lot of places. We have labor, regu you know, restrictions and regulations. You can shut down coal. You can start regenerative, 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 regen you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> regenerative um, you know, environmental, you know, fixing up of the land that was mined. And then you can retrain an entire workforce to be creating solar, um, wind, you know, nuclear, if that's the way you want to go. I'm not a huge fan of that, but that's another option. You know, water is a huge source of energy. And Mike Cannonbrook says it beautifully in the film. He says, you know, we have... We have the best natural resources in the world. Look at this country. It's 90% desert. We have the most sun, you know, and he's working on some really cool technology projects to change things like making this super cable that goes to Singapore that will export solar power. You know, Australia will be able to, would be able to power Asia easily just with our solar power. Um, and that requires a lot of work and a lot of employment. But, boy, we talk about using something not out of the ground but using the sun to do that is extraordinary. We just have to do it. And Australia's in a position where the government even is still not promoting electric cars. You know, we have this section in the film where, you know, the Prime Minister says, you know, an electric car, will, you know, can't tow your trailer, you can't go away for a weekend. And it's like I've been driving an electric car for, like, I'm on my ninth year and I travel all over the place. So it's just this... It's just this, like, you know, I hate to say it, old white men making stupid decisions um, and endangering all of us. But it's funny because I don't have kids and, you know, I'm not going to be around for that much longer. Um, so, I sh you know, it'll get hotter towards the end of my life. But, you know, it's sort of like why am I worrying about this when all of these leaders around the world have families and kids and grandkids and it's like they don't give a shit about them. It's just astonishing to me. Their job is to plan for the future and all they do is plan for now and it's not serving us. Um, so the film's making its world premiere uh, at Toronto, and um, uh, when will other audiences uh, get to see it? Um, I don't have a firm day yet. I think I can sort of say towards the end of the year it's going to come out globally on Amazon, and we'll be doing a few uh, festivals in between. So it's a very similar re release to Bikram. It's such a nice homecoming, sort of before and after COVID, having two films have their world premiere at TIFF and then release shortly after. So I think it'll be in a couple of months. Um, and global, so which is great. I mean, it's great having a platform, um, you know, like Amazon, where it can just go out like that to the world. It's really, for a filmmaker, it's very gratifying. Uh, well, Eva, thank you very much uh, for your film and for being with us today. Thanks, Tom. Hope to see you in a couple of weeks. That's right. Bye.